Good afternoon YouTube. Observations of death by warbles on a lot for Sage Bodice Vatter's collaborative video. Well it might sound like a silly kind of a thing to say but I feel as if I've been studying death most of my life. First time I witnessed a fatal injury I was six years old sitting in a bus with a window seat overlooking the highway and the kid who sat behind me in first class in infant school chased a ball between the two buses in front of the bus I was sitting in. I heard the screech of the tyres, I looked out the window, I saw the Mini Miner standing on its nose wheels with smoke coming out from under the wheels and I could see his hand on his arm up above the bonnet. His fingers were grasping for something to hang on to and I was looking through the back window of the Mini Miner and through the windscreen. Well. That was the first time I saw a fatal injury, and he lived for three days. Uh, the next year, one of the girls in my class was playing on the weekend in a tree with a skipping rope with wooden handles. Now, her father had died the previous year, so she was a fatherless waif, and nobody ever knew whether she meant to kill herself or whether she just fell out of the tree and caught herself by the neck with the skipping rope. The next 12 months was incident free you might say and uh, when I was in fourth class one of the kids in my maths class was shot by his big brother through the heart with the father's 22 big brother had been cleaning it and he'd been dry firing it and there wasn't enough fire discipline in his instruction for him to know that you should never point any gun shaped object at anything unless you'd be prepared to shoot that thing. So not realising that He'd already put the magazine back in. He worked the action, pointed it at his little brother and shot him through the heart. So, that was primary school. The next time I saw death up close and personal, it was in a formal setting. I was a student nurse at uh, Tamworth Base Hospital. And during our preliminary training school, they gave us a three-day seminar on death and dying based on the book about the stages of grief by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. So in 1980 when I was 19 and the first time I had a patient actually die and I had to lay them out I had a pretty fair amount of emotional preparation for it but it was still quite a heavy event you know there's a big difference between a person who has a soul in their body and a person who used to have a soul in their body. It's a major quantum shift, you know, it's just totally different. But, uh, well, Tamworth Base Hospital and I didn't get along too well, and after a month on the wards, I found myself reapplying at Concord Repat, which was a much bigger hospital. And, uh, well, down there I got to study death for three years, because um, World War II was a long time ago, even in the 1980s. And we had a fair bit of death as student nurses. And some of the uh, witnessings of death were macabre and some were fairly bizarre, you know, like the macabre would encompass the time I sent a patient or I escorted a patient down to nuclear medicine. And while he was down having a scan on his cancer of the everything, he died. And the sister in charge of the nuclear medical ward didn't want or have the facilities to lay out a corpse. So, uh, one of the other students from my training group went down to collect this patient and they had the bloke sitting up on a trolley wearing an oxygen mask absolutely dead and my friend who was also a first year student nurse did as he was told and wheeled the corpse back through the entire hospital he got to the elevators and the corpse's son came running to join the elevator because he hoped for one last glimpse of his father and there were some pretty awkward explanations in the elevator leading back up to the ward so that's kind of the, the macabre. The bizarre would encompass an enormously overweight corpse on a trolley with omnidirectional wheels and a slight slope leading down to the morgue and losing control of the trolley on the slope in the rain and actually sideswiping and denting a car that was parked. So yeah, there were some strange things happened around death. One of the things I learned at Concord is that if you know somebody's going to die and they're anxious about it, you probably should tell them about it because it's not real fun for them when it comes as a surprise. And I had a handover report one morning and they told me that a fella had a tumour in his lungs and we weren't to tell him because that was the doctor's job. 
and he was pumping me for information because he knew that I knew and I wasn't allowed to tell him. And uh, I came out from the bathroom with a different patient, turned around and watched this fellow with a great fountain of blood, you know, coming metres out of his mouth because the tumour had chewed through his coronary, uh, his um, pulmonary artery and he was drowning. And he locked eyes on me as he fell to the floor and the look in his eyes said, you bastard, you knew this was going to happen. And I hadn't told him. Another one that really kind of sticks in the mind. There was a bloke who was drunk driving, again in a Mini Minor, and he had a sober hitchhiker and he drove his Mini Minor with such verve and precision that he snapped a telegraph pole off at ground level. And he mashed his own pelvis up pretty bad and I was scouting nurse in operating theatre while they were working on putting the bones back together in the, the pelvis and the legs of the bloke who was driving the car. But I also got to be scout nurse when they took the kidneys out of the passenger. And he was this 21 year old bloke and he was wheeled into operating theatre and yes he was on a respirator but when they took the respirator off him he was still breathing. And all of his paperwork was filled out and it was my job as the scout nurse after they stuck a suction pipe up his aorta and his heart went into overdrive and his body lifted up off the bloody operating table despite the anaesthetic and all of his lifeblood pumped into the vacuum bottles beside me, it was my job to note the time that his heart actually stopped and write it on his death certificate because they'd already filled it in and signed it before they sent him up to us. Hey, I've done a surgical murder on somebody to harvest their kidneys and uh, I have a very low opinion of the entire transplant industry ever since. They are fucking ghouls. And ghoulish behaviour is something that I know a little bit about because we used to actually compete with each other for proof of how closely we had witnessed death in real life. And we actually kept souvenirs and took notes. Here's your world's fastest course in electrocardiology. This is what it's meant to look like. And the runner-up in the group 4 1980 competition to record the sickest possible electrocardiogram was this bloke coming into casualty in the middle of a heart attack. I'm pretty sure he did not die that day. Unlike this particular individual who I was told at handover report at 7 o'clock in the morning, they said, he's your patient. He's had two cardiac arrests during the night. He's been resuscitated twice. And the doctors have decided that when this flask of medication runs out, and it's between him and his God theory and his heart muscle, how much longer he lives. So... It's not quite like an infantryman in the field keeping a necklace of ears. But this is the real-time electrocardiogram of the final heartbeat, which one warbles the honours of the sickest possible electrocardiogram that you can record in real life. So, after three years of that level of intensity, off I went to be sister in charge of the Vegetable Creek Hospital at Emmerville. When I was a second year student nurse, I had occasion to uh, want to shoot myself. The girlfriend's father had died, I had to tell her that he was dead. She thought that, you know, if she just got rid of me then it would take away the pain and I went down that spiral depressive track where you get drunk. And the girlfriend who followed me to drink, who drove me to drink, followed me and then called the police you know and in the meantime she told me that yes you should shoot yourself so I spent some time sitting there sucking on a gun barrel and I had a pre vu I had a flash forwards and uh, I was trapped at ceiling height and I couldn't get out of the room and I had a deep understanding that because I had chosen to die in the room therefore I was stuck in the room and uh, there was no body on the ground, but there was a big mess of blood and brains and bones and bits of shit all over the wall behind where my head had been. And, um, and then the two little old cleaning ladies came in. And they were talking Yugoslavian, but I could understand them. And they said, isn't it a pity that he's killed himself over an argument with a girlfriend whose face he would not have been able to remember if he just got on with life and lived for another five years? 
And the next thing I knew, I was no longer a disembodied ghost stuck in the room. I was spitting the gun barrel out. All right? Now, I had that near-death experience in my second year of nursing, after I'd traced other people's moment of death. And in the third year, I was watching a television interview with Dr Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who's brought out a new book where she'd studied a couple of thousand people who'd had near-death experiences. And she was talking to a combat veteran, and his near-death experience had consisted of floating up and flying out from the casualty clearing station back to the paddy field where he'd lost both his legs and one arm. And while he was a ghost in the paddy field, he couldn't get out of the paddy field. And he couldn't drop any of his equipment, but he had both his legs and his arm. And if he shouted in the ear of somebody who he'd been, you know, platoon mates with, they'd sort of wipe at their ear as if there was a mosquito buzzing around. And then he got sucked up out of the paddy field and flew back at jet fighter speed to the casualty clearing station, and as he went back in through the roof of the tent, he got a pin-sharp image of a surgical team turning away from the body that they were working on, that they had not been able to do much with, and they went over and picked his body out of the pile of red tags which had been considered too far gone to work on. And as the bottle of stable plasma protein solution went into his IV, that's when he went thump back into his body and he woke up in the recovery ward. So I've had a bit of experience of near-death experiences, you know, the Prejo vu type, which line up with what other people have had to say. And uh, I'm pretty sure that death is a new beginning uh, in, in not the material world, but you're in the first and lowest heaven of the earth. You're right here where we are now. But um, there are limitations, and it all kind of depends on what spiritual learnings you've made for yourself while you were alive. If you've learnt that um, the stock market's all that matters, well, your ghost will go back to the stock exchange and you'll hover around contributing to the atmosphere of a bull or a bear market. If booze is all that matters, then off you'll go back to the pub and contribute to the atmosphere of have another drink for the road. But anyway, when I went to work at Vegetable Creek, all I knew is that death is a natural, unavoidable thing and you might as well do it with some dignity. So when the old people who'd already spent one winter tied up in a chair with dementia. When they got a cold, I'd ring their relatives, the near ones, and say, look, talk it over with the far-flung relations, discuss whether you want somebody to come up and talk to the doctor, and uh, make a decision tomorrow morning about whether your ancient relative is going to get antibiotics or not, because if you don't think they need another winter on the veranda, tied into the chair shitting themselves, don't give them the antibiotics, because pneumonia was called the old person's friend. And after setting that little cart in motion, a couple of times I've had to sit there and hold the hand of the ancient relative when the far-flung relations have come back to say goodbye, but they don't want to be there for the chain stokes respirations and the last gasp. And it was my responsibility. Second last time I had a really close look at a fatal injury was in 1994 when a neophyte called Quentin strapped into an advanced rated hang glider and got towed into the ground by a different tow team and a tug flown by a man who did not believe that there was any need to have a ground-based observer in command of the launch. And at the time, I knew that we were pretty good, but I did not realise that Aero Towing Adventures Australia were actually the world leaders in safely aero towing hang gliders. And I had to... Uh, send my crash analysis to the Civil Aviation Safety Authority to get the pilot-induced oscillation and lockout index made mandatory industry standard for aero towing training operations. Sadly, though I helped resuscitate Quentin, he lived for only three days, but my method was made mandatory industry standard for all aero towing operations after only one more person died. And the last time I witnessed death right up close was when I identified Canada John, my best friend, who came to me for advice about aeroplanes. You see? And I wrote his crash analysis for the police and the coroner and identified him in a body bag. And I keep his relics. But life does go on.